Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Foundation, part of the uh, Finding Genius podcast. I have Herbert Levine. Uh, He's a university distinguished professor at Northeastern University, part of the physics and college of engineering and bioengineering departments. Talking about cancer today, probably particularly about the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which facilitates metastases. Herbert, thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. If you would, tell me about your research, please. Sure. I come from a somewhat unusual background for someone who's going to be talking about cancer. My background is actually theoretical physics. And theoretical physics, you know, most people don't quite understand what that has to do with cancer or biology in general. And my research has been devoted over now a number of decades to try to argue that that's actually a misconception. Actually, the ideas of physics, the methods of physics, the computational strategies that have been developed in physical science really, in my opinion, can offer new complementary insight into many biological phenomena. And in particular, my interest is in the uh, biological phenomena of cancer and uh, cancer progression, how tumors go from being primary tumors, treatable, more or less, to being metastatic tumors, to being almost a death sentence in most, in most cases. So what is it about theoretical physics that helps you have new insights into uh, tumors and cancer? So biology is is very complicated. And for a a long time, biologists have been mostly looking at things from a relatively qualitative perspective. And that's been okay for many diseases, which are what you might consider to be single gene diseases. So if a single gene is wrong, a single protein is not functional, uh, then you get a disease and you can understand what the problem is. You can understand how to treat it. That paradigm hasn't really worked for cancer. People have looked for uh, very, very specific ways in which genes cause cancer. They've looked for individual genes that can enable things like cancer metastasis. And it hasn't really worked out. And, And our perspective is, that cancer and, and in fact, many complicated diseases are work by the combination of many different factors all working together in a very complex but nonetheless organized way to give you the, the consequences of the disease. That's a type of problem that requires mathematics. It requires uh, computational strategies to try to address And the physical sciences is where typically those things have been developed, those things have been studied for a long period of time. And so we, I, you know, I and and my colleagues who who agree with me have uh, argued that bringing those methodologies uh, to cancer, being able to uh, write down uh, mathematical and eventually computational models that can predict how all the various pieces are interacting uh, really is going to be a new way to make progress more quickly than just following a sort of more traditional biological perspective. 
So, for instance, on a tumor, if, um, you know, I guess now we're able to do single cell sequencing. Correct. Has anyone sequenced, let's say, you know, spatially, radially, volumetrically, a thousand or so tumor cells, and then you use, uh, let's say, computer modeling software to, you so know, turn, it, the, turn back the dial of time to see how the tumor grew and where it came from? So I don't know if we're quite at that stage in a live tumor, but in a laboratory setting where you take tumor cells and grow them in a more controlled environment, the answer is yes. So we've worked, for example, over the last uh, year or so with a group at MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is in Houston, Texas. It's actually the world's largest cancer center. We've worked with a group there to do exactly that, focusing on how one can understand the process by which cancer cells go from being immotile, stuck together, growing out of control, but forming a primary tumor, but nonetheless, how they go from that stage to being migratory, leaving the primary tumor, going throughout the rest of the body. I said, we've done that in a more, in a more laboratory controlled setting rather than inside a person, because obviously that's much more difficult. But in a laboratory setting, you can uh, take cells, you can study them as a function of time as they undergo this transition, and you can use the ideas of physics to then understand what is it about the genes and their interactions that is enabling that transition to take place. And we think that we do offer insight beyond what could be uh, done just by uh, directly sort of looking at the data without that computational perspective. So the answer is definitely yes in a, in a more controlled setting. And as time goes on and technology improves, uh, increasingly also will be possible in an in vivo uh, human patient setting. But when you say it's in, in vitro in a controlled setting, are you working with like a tumor that has been taken out by a surgeon or are you using an organoid to build up a tumor so, from scratch? So both. I mean, both. I mean, the, the, the simplest experimental system is just where you have cancer cell lines. So these are set, you know, particular cells that have been isolated at some point from a patient, but uh, now are just uh, repeatedly grown within the cancer laboratories. And you can place those in a 3D environment uh, and, uh, you know, just sort of let a tumor grow. Those are sometimes called tumor spheroids. The next level up of technology is what you refer to as organoids, where you actually mix a variety of cells under more physiological conditions, and those begin to more recapitulate what the tumor would be doing in a live setting. So we've done both of those. We've studied both uh, this sort of tumor spheroid paradigm, which is simpler, uh, more also moving towards more tumor organoids. But uh, neither of those cases capture, of course, what happens inside a, a real person. And we also work to some extent with, of course, the cancer biologists, because they, they're the ones who do the experiments. We also work to some extent in, uh, in models of uh, tumors in, in mice. So where you take uh, these cell lines, you reimplant them back in mice, and of course, you can then follow them much more carefully by direct imaging. You can actually image inside mice, uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, you can also sacrifice the mice on uh, as a function of time and get direct pictures of how the tumor is how tumors are progressing in parallel sets of experiments. So all those are being done, and I would say it's not quite ready for doing this very high throughput, very high data rate, very high computational analysis for real inpatient data. But I think we're moving, we're getting towards that. And as, as, uh, as I said, as technology increases over time. So how is the heterogeneity of a tumor characterized using some of these methods so far? Like what are some of the insights? So the particular thing we focused on, as I think you mentioned in your introduction, is something called the epithelial mesenchymal transition. That's a very uh, long uh, sounding name. Uh, it really refers directly to the fact that tumor cells are epithelial in, in most tumors, uh, in uh, carcinomas, which are tumors that arise uh, from epithelial-like tissues, which is, again, sounds complicated, but really lungs, kidneys, pancreas, breast, all those are epithelial tissues. And so much of the tumor uh, many of the tumors that we have in, in the real world arise from epithelial tissues. And the cells inside those tumors, when they first become cancerous, uh, they break their controls over growth. So they're growing out of control. You get a lump in your breast, you get a region in your lung, which is a nodule. And 
Those cells still epithelial in character, which means that they're stuck to each other. They're not going anywhere. They're staying within the breast or within the lung. And in those cases... Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. Uh, we can treat the, you know, the patient by surgery or by localized radiation therapy. And those work, you know, of course, with better or for worse in different contexts. But we have treatments that at least work in a, in a variety, in, in a, I would say, majority of patients in something like now breast cancer. Mesenchymal, the other end of this epithelial mesenchymal transition is cells that are more active. They're more able to move from one part of the body to the other. They're more typical of cells like immune cells, which are not stuck together, but which are actually constantly patrolling throughout our body, looking for invasive uh, viruses or tumor cells. So cancer cells are usually not epith- are usually not mesenchymal, but they can undergo this transition. Now, not all the cells in the tumor undergo this transition. There's a huge amount of heterogeneity. If you look at one of these in vitro settings and you do single cell measurements of RNA transcription, what you discover is that even under common circumstances, you apply the same perturbation to all the cells indicative of what should be happening in an in vivo setting, you apply the same perturbation, and yet the cells are all doing different things. And so some cells will undergo this transition completely and will become completely mesenchymal cells. Other cells will undergo this transition to what we've called a hybrid state. And this hybrid state is somewhere it gets stuck halfway between epithelial and mesenchymal. And the really interesting finding that we we generated with, with our computational models, and now we've worked to try to prove this in, uh, in experimental systems, is cells that get stuck in this intermediate state. So the, the small number relatively within a large tumor, but the small number of cells that have a particular type of heterogeneity actually are the ones that can be the most dangerous in terms of being able to survive transit through the body and start a tumor somewhere else. And the reason for that is that this heterogeneity manifests itself not just in getting stuck between these epithelial and mesenchymal states, but it manifests itself in in sort of reverting back to a more primitive uh, cell form. Sometimes we, we think of that as more like a stem cell. And stem cells are, of course, known for being able to grow in environments, produce new objects. And so the study of this type of heterogeneity that refers to different as to, to getting stuck or getting uh, or, or forming cells with different sort of progression along this axis going from epithelial to mesenchymal really can offer insights into what are the types of cells that can really um, enable metastasis. And so this has been a very interesting finding, and, 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 and uh, it was done, you know, with a combination of, you know, experimental biology, informatics, just analyzing data from, uh, from different uh, patients, and also with uh, computational analysis of laboratory experiments. So it's a combination of all these tools brought together that I think really is making progress in some of these questions. So what, what are the stages? Are, do they have defined stages, the epithelial and mesenchymal um, transition and and if so, what's observed at each? Yeah, so so they don't. It's not clear if they're really defined stages because cell. I mean, it it seems. I mean, this is actually something which is being de- which is debated in the field. So, uh, for for example, in one of the key experiments that was published in Nature about two years ago, uh, they took cells uh, from I think it was um, skin cancer, and they looked. Uh, they took out cells from, it was again a mouse experiment, took out cells from the mouse, labeled them via where they were along this axis, and then reinserted them and sort of proved that the ones that were in the middle were the ones that were the most capable of starting new metastasis. So this is one of the key experiments 
uh, that I think points to the way this new way of thinking about the problem. And they, you know, based on their particular analysis, they decided there were sort of six different states. There was a. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Purely epithelial, purely mesenchymal, and they they could identify sort of four way stations along the way. Now, my attitude is that that's an operational definition. You know, they had a particular way of analyzing their uh, cells. And when they analyzed it that way, they decided there were four way stations. If that is that really true, or is that going to be a, a general property? I don't think so. I think in every tumor type, there might be a different number of possible intermediate states. And I think the, the more general feature, which is that the ones that are away from the edges uh, are the ones that are most primitive and most capable, therefore, of starting new, new tumors, is the more general result that then proves true. So the the details of exactly, you know, are there three cell states? Are there five? Are there six? Are there a continuum of cell states that you can't really distinguish way, specific way stations? I think is a, is very system dependent. It's very, very specific tumor dependent, but the basic principle of how that could change our picture of the way metastasis work, I think is very general. I think that's also just a a parenthetical remark about that. That's sort of also the type of sort of physics, sort of at least physics thinking that I'm, I'm more used to than perhaps some people coming from more pure biology perspective is that we tend to, you know, it's sort of funny because people think that physicists like lots of details and they like, you know, getting everything down quantitatively. We actually like very general concepts, at least in theoretical physics. We like general ideas of, you know, how things work and how, and how general, and the more general an idea is, the more we're interested in, the more specific an idea is to a very, very uh, unique context, the less interested we are, at least speaking for myself. And so, the issue of exactly how many different types of cells there might be on uh, as way stations, as you called them, is a very, you know, different people have looked at different tumor types and different organs and different patients and have come up with different numbers. So to me, that means that that's a very, very specific question. And the, however, they've almost all come to the conclusion that the ability to generate new tumors are enhanced by being in this sort of in in one of these intermediate hybrid states. And that to me is a very general uh, finding. And therefore that's a much more interesting uh, conclusion than, than, than the specific details of how that, you know, in detail works itself out in, in, in a given case. So what are the hallmarks though of uh, various cells? You you spoke about them being more primitive, but does that mean they have certain mutations that other ones don't? It's it's not so much about mutations because it's more about their gene expression patterns. So, so this is why RNA seq is the is the technique of of, uh, of immediate uh, utility in studying these things. So it's not so cells that are undergoing these transitions uh, really are not changing uh, very much. They might have a few mutations here or there, but that's not really what's driving this transition. This is a transition that occurs purely in how gene expression works and. And part of the evidence for this is that this type of transition is not unique to cancer cells. It's actually used in developmental biology when, you know, developmental biology, you have cells growing in one part of the developing embryo. And sometimes based on the logic of, of developmental progression, sometimes those cells need to move to other locations uh, within the body where they'll, you know, then form whatever uh, organ they're going to form. So there's a particular case uh, where it was studied in great detail uh, called neural crest cell migration, where cells are made in one place and then they migrate to another place. And this idea, and it was discovered a long time ago by now that those cells underwent this epithelial mesenchymal transition without actually having any mutations at all. So it wasn't that their genotype or their genome changed in order to do this during development, genomes don't change. Uh, And it was more just a question of because of being exposed to various uh, perturbations from their environment, their gene expression pattern changed. So what we actually believe in, in cancer is it's a combination of the two, but that the primary cause of this transition really is a change in a gene expression pattern. Uh, one example where that was sort of shown uh, somewhat indirectly was 
and again, I'm switching from one cancer type to the other almost on purpose because I wanted, because I think these ideas are quite general. There was a, a interesting study in the context of melanoma, again, using mice, because that's where you can do these studies, where melanoma was growing within some skin tissue. And what they showed is that in a different part of the skin, as the melanoma, as the primary melanoma got bigger and bigger, it reached a new physical position within the skin tissue of this particular mouse model of melanoma. And in that region were sort of new environmental factors, new signaling factors, new uh, sort of a new biochemical environment, a new biophysical environment. And that signaling induced this change from epithelial to mesenchymal-like states. So no genes were involved. I mean, genes were involved, but no mutations were involved. It wasn't that you mutated genes and that changed the nature of the cell. It's that you expose cells to a new environment and that changed their nature. So it's not really about genes. It's really about expression. And expression is connected very closely with the uh, organization of the DNA because uh, the way cells one of the ways cells differentiate, which uh, of course means that they begin to express one set of genes and to make one proteins from one set of genes and uh, don't make proteins from other sets of genes. For example, if they're going to be a liver cell, they only need uh, proteins relevant for liver function and not for kidney function. Um, the way cells do that is they have these interacting networks of genes, but then they also have a ways of modifying the structure of their DNA, which are called chromosomes uh, and chromatin, uh, such that genes that are going to be needed and re going to uh, be sort of in open regions of the DNA, easy to access. Uh, so therefore, they're going to be easy for the RNA polymerase, the machinery that translates uh, eventually the first step of the translation of DNA into proteins, uh, makes it easy for that to access those genes. And other genes are sort of folded away, put in the closet, uh, you know, put in mothballs and, you know, not used again. And so uh, when cells are very differentiated, such as epithelial cells, completely epithelial cells, or completely mesenchymal cells, uh, different genes are sort of mothballed and put away and not used. These cells that are in the middle, these hybrid cell states that are, you know, at one of these intermediate way stations, uh, revert back to cells that are more plastic, that are more able, that much more of the DNA is in these open structures. So it has the possibility of creating proteins that are relevant, not just for an epithelially differentiated cell, not just for a mesenchymally differentiated cell, but for sort of both as needed. So this extra degree of freedom, these extra, you know, sort of plastic uh, ability to respond to local environments is what we think is the key to the cell's abilities to then form new tumors in, let's say, other parts of the body. So you're talking about the gene expression. Does this mean yeah. epigenetics or transcriptomics? Yeah, so or? Right, so both. So both. So the answer is the transcriptomics changes, but even more fundamentally, the chromatin structure really is, you know, that, I mean, I, I define epigenetics as the study of how, you know, structure of DNA and its binding proteins affect gene expression. And, and uh, so yeah, that, that's a very key ingredient. And it's been very clear that being stuck at one of these less, less differentiated, more primitive cell types really has a lot to do with opening up the epigenetics, the structure of the DNA, making uh, epigenetically uh, it much more capable of uh, adapting to local environments than cells that are very differentiated, very, you know, know what their place is, know what they're supposed to be doing. And then when faced with a new environment, such as if you take a, a normal cell from the breast and put it in the bone, it it basically commits suicide because it has no idea how to survive there. If you take one of these cells that started out as a breast cell, but underwent this partial transition to a sort of more, you know, sort of stem-like precursor to breast cells, those are cells that are, you know, used to or expecting to be uh, going various different ways as they measure their local environment. And when they get to the bone environment, they can actually adapt well enough to start growing there. And so we feel that's that change in their epigenetics uh, is what is very uh, relevant for the ability to 
grow in new environments. And by the way, it's also very relevant for their ability to survive uh, drug treatments. There's been a long time, no, it's been noticed for a very long time that uh, metastatic disease uh, is much more drug resistant than primary tumors. And, you know, why? Dr- uh, drug resistant to already applied drugs? or drug Well, yes, to, to uh, drugs? To, well, to both traditional chemotherapy drugs and also to uh, more targeted therapies. So take your standard chemotherapy that's been around forever. The metastatic tumors are much less treatable by a whole array of uh, these chemotherapy drugs than primary tumors. And this is the part of the reason why metastasis is essentially the, the, the deadly part of, the, of cancers is because not just is it that you've now involved other organs of your body, but many of our standard treatments just stop working. And, part, and so this underlying plasticity, which is the driving force for creating the metastatic tumor, uh, also enables cells, in our opinion, and, you know, to withstand uh, more pressure from these applied therapies, from drugs. Right. So has anyone been able to characterize how epigenetic changes arise? Like what, you know, what are the conditions needed to cause them? And can anyone correlate uh, if you have this stressor, then it, it leads to this epigenetic change? Yeah, I, I would say that's that's sort of what people are working on. Uh, I wouldn't say it's 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 sort of we I don't think we we know how to do that in a general sense. I think in in specific cases, uh, it's been pretty clear how to do that. So in specific cases, uh, for example, one can trace how an environmental change will give rise to the upregulation of some transcription factor, and that transcription factor will then call into play some epigenetic modifiers. And so as in, in specific cases, you can, we can trace uh, through that uh, sort of progression of molecular events. That, that causes that. I wouldn't say that we know how to do that in general. I think it's in a case by case basis. Uh, again, you know, somehow the, the one of the watchwords of biology is heterogeneity. So uh, not one size fits all. You know, in some cases you see one set of epigenetic changes. In other cases you see different sets. And how to understand that is still, I think, under investigation by the community. But it's very clear to everybody that uh, the epigenetic changes are a key part of this uh, uh, ability of cells to, uh, to, to metastasize, to, to create new metastas- metastatic lesions. So this may be a way out question, but as a theoretical physicist, do you see any corollaries or similarities between anything that goes on in you know, a larger universe or on a different, completely different scale than, than biology, than cancer? Um, uh, anything that relates that that's, seems vaguely familiar? You know, so, so you might you, you might ask a different question, which is how the hell I got into this field in the first place. Uh, you know, what was this you know, card carrying physicist who was working on you know nice you know dead systems? How did you start working on uh, biology and then eventually on cancer? And and the answer is that you know I was always curious about biology. I would read biology books. I would you know whatever watch Nova or whatever. Uh, and uh, I did start seeing parallels between well, some of the things we were trying to understand about complex systems and physics uh, and the way biological systems uh, seem to work. So I was studying a variety of interesting dynamical processes in physics, which to me, you know, uh, looked relevant to saying, well, gee, you know, uh, if, 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 if non-living systems can create these structures, can have these interesting dynamical properties, uh, pres- you know, maybe we can find analogs of that in, in living systems. And uh, I think this was a general, you know, discussed view among, you know, my colleagues in, in, in the area of physics I was working in. This was now uh, circa let's say the mid nineties or so. Yes, I am that old. And we, so we tried to find ways in which we could use that analogy, but in sort of the reverse direction than you just asked about. So we, 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 we wanted to sort of think about biological problems because they're so fascinating and so important in a medical context. And so we looked for ways in which our physics uh, examples and insights seem to be relevant for biology. So we did find them. I mean, it depends. So for example, the way in which uh, physical systems can generate structures, uh, you know, dynamically generate structures. And, you know, the, 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 f- the poster child for that in the physics world is the growth of something like snow crystals, which, you know, you start out with featureless water molecules and you get these beautiful patterns. Uh, 
So that's a dynamical process which relies on input from the outside, it relies on various dynamical system ideas. And we started to study things like, well, how do biological systems organize? How does development work? How, you know, do the ideas that allow physical and chemical systems to organize, can they give us insight into biological processes? So there were analogies that we pushed. And of course, at, at some point, I think we, we decided that, at least I decided that the analogies are useful up to a certain point, And then they stop being completely relevant because, you know, biological systems, you know, have unique features that are not present in physical systems, unique features like being shaped by uh, evolution over long periods of time to be functional. Uh, physical systems are not functional. Even the most beautiful snow crystal is not doing anybody any good other than, you know, looking at it and being impressed. So, so there's sort of extra, let's say, constraints on how biological systems work uh, because of the way they're formed by evolution, because they need to be functional. And that sort of makes the sort of analogy diverge a bit. So there are analogies at both at the technical level and also more conceptually. But I think that uh, there's nothing which immediately strikes me uh, to be similar to cancer. I mean, cancer is a disease where the cooperation between the individual cells and the way they're they understand their role within an organism somehow breaks down because of mutations and they no longer, you know, they're sort of now uh, revert to some, uh, you know, we're going to just try to grow as quickly as we can and take over this whole body, you know, the organism be damned. There's nothing quite like that in, in, the, in, in the physical world because there's no sense in which individual molecules have been by evolution sort of designed to know their place in a, glo in a more global structure they just do what they do and they create these great structures, but they're not, there are no constraints in place to prevent them from doing what, the, what they, what they otherwise would do. And I, and my, the secret for cancer is that, you know, the, the evolution of multicellular organisms uh, did place those constraints, single you know, cells in our organs are not supposed to be growing out of control. They're supposed to only grow when they need to grow under the control of some very, very carefully designed orchestrated a genetic pattern of, of interactions, cancer breaks that due to its mutations. And now you have things that are growing out of control and behaving in, a, in an unusual way, but you need to understand what got broken in under, order to understand how the, you know, how the breaking is manifesting itself. And in the physics world, there's nothing quite analogous to, you know, the design, the evolutionary design built into the way it worked in the first place. So it's a, it's a complicated answer. But uh, I think there are useful analogies. Certainly for me, historically, those analogies were very critical in getting started working in this field. But I think one can take them too far. And so I try not to. I try to sort of keep my balance there. If you, if you compare healthy tissue to cancerous tissue, yes. does one or the other seem to follow you know, general physics principles more closely yes. than the other? Which one's more? Yeah, I, think, I think cancer is, I mean, I think cancer is more close to, to more to general physics principles than, let's say, uh, perfectly normal developmental biology. I'll give you another example, which I've argued for a long time. You can ask, which is easier to understand from general physics principles, brain development, which is incredibly complicated, versus uh, somebody with uh, epilepsy, some, you know, with the brain going into some type of epileptic seizure. So from my perspective, an epileptic seizure is a very, is a, is something which is not very carefully designed by evolution. Evolution doesn't create some very, very careful design pattern of this neuron fires here and that neuron fires there and that gives you an epileptic seizure. It's like a physics phenomenon. It's like, oh, you have overexcited neurons that egg each other on and you get an epileptic seizure. So that's easier to understand based on physics principles than something like how the brain builds itself out of nothing, which to me is a, you know, incredible mystery, which I'm sure will not be solved in my lifetime. So cancer is sort of similar that, you know, the, the regular organization, the regular developmental biology and homeostatic interactions that keep uh, bodies operating, you know, relatively perfectly uh, over many, many decades is a lot harder to understand than how is it that if some cells loose their boundaries and, you know, and, and sort of break some of these uh, control mechanisms that then they can get, they can cause something like cancer. So when I think about working on biological problems, besides the obvious, uh, you know, medical interest, I think that cancer is more tractable starting from a, from a physical science perspective than, than some other problems in biology. 
So your answer. So your what what is does that mean that it's more tractable? Like what features of it make it you know more, more understandable? That you know you don't have to that the phenomena don't require understanding the special role of each gene and each cell. So I'll give you maybe an example. So one of the things that's been very surprising in the biology community is how variable the genetic patterns are for for even the same cancer. So you go into the clinic with uh, pancreatic cancer or something, and of course, these days they'll sequence tumor and I think it's, it was turned out to be very surprising on the, you know, 10, 20 years ago when they discovered that, you know, even things that clinically were, were sort of considered the same type of tumor, you know, pancreatic cancer, cells growing in one region of the pancreas or, or the lung or whatever, that the genetic details were incredibly variable. There were just huge numbers of differences that didn't seem to almost, I mean, there were some similarities, but there didn't seem to be almost any sense in which this was a unique genetic pattern that was being realized. So that's what I mean. So so from a physics point of view, the less unique it is, the less you have to know every single gene and its role and how it couples to every other gene, the more what you see is a general consequence of the way genes work and the way they interact with each other, the more uh, sort of physics way of thinking can help you. So, so my feeling is that that evidence where people, so in, in the context of metastasis, you know, people looked for 10 years for what is the gene for metastasis? Is there some gene that turns on that all of a sudden gets you from the primary tumor to cells that can now metastasize? And there was none. In every single case people looked at, it was different sets of genes that turned on. There were always mutations. There were always changes because otherwise it wouldn't be cancer, but they were always different. So the idea of being able to metastasize, to be able to move and be able to start growing somewhere else is more general than just saying there's one gene that controls that. It's a general property of how cells are organized. Cells can do that. They usually don't do that because they're prevented from doing that. But you can study that process in a very general sense. You can study how cells move and in other contexts, and you can realize that the tumor cells can do that also. Uh, without knowing that there's a specific gene that turned on that is the unique reason why that tumor cell can can move or can start a new thing, a new direction. So that sort of generality and that sort of more, let's say, universal way of thinking about what the possibilities are, I think is closer to the way physicists like to think about their problem uh, compared to so, uh, you know, more detailed, uh, you know, very, very specific approach, which I personally think is necessary for something like a you know carefully orchestrated developmental biology system. So if you compare your thoughts on how cancer first arises versus what happens to cause metastases, yeah. You know what do the two compare closely or are they completely different processes and I think what do you think they are? I think they they compare on a conceptual level they compare closely because on a conceptual level uh, again you know cancer start for a variety of, I mean they all start via some type of mutational process but those all can be very different the actual transitions you know the a lot of the sort of linear thinking I think has gone away for example it used to be that people said oh first you get this mutation then you get that mutation then you get this mutation then you then you be able then you're able to metastasize well it turns out that even that that women, I, I know this because we're, we're we're trying to work on something related to this. Even women with very very early breast cancer already have cancer cells that have metastasized to the bone or the or the lung or whatever. Even when their breast cancers are very small, uh, that's why you have cases where people are treated, completely cured, and then twenty years later they come back with metastatic disease. So in the in the context of cancer initiation, the generality or the uh, let's say. Uh, a lack of uh, specificity of how it really works is is really about the genetic mutations. I mean, the things which drive cancer initiation and initial growth are about cancer mutations that appear that let you grow when you're not supposed to. And also, I think increasingly about uh, how uh, those mutations arrange themselves to somehow not trigger your immune system to attack the cancer. So those are different than the metastatic context. The metastatic context, you already have large cancer cells. And to us, it's more about epigenetics, change in expression patterns, changing the way those cells are behaving rather than their underlying uh, mutational state. But the fact that there's sort of not a one-to-one correspondence between these sort of individual molecular events, whether it's 
mutational event or it's a epigenetic change in a, in a, in a structure in, in, in DNA leading to a change in gene expression, the fact that there's no correlation between those individual molecular events, uh, no direct correlation between those individual molecular events and what you're seeing on the sort of, you know, let's say macroscopic or, you know, microscopic, but I mean, you know, the cellular and tissue level scale is, I think, a commonality between uh, cancer initiation and cancer progression, that those principles are the same. Now, the details of what you do with that, of course, can be very different, but uh, at least the way of thinking about it, I think, could be somewhat similar. So might that tell you that cancer may arise as a forced adaptation that becomes a maladaptation by cells exposed to like stressors over time? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we know that uh, that can happen. Those stressors can be, but, but uh, it most cancer, I mean, I think most cancers still arise. I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't study in detail cancer initiation. So, I mean, I only have, you know, whatever, you know, opinions based on, you know, what I read the same as everybody else. I think most cancers still happen initially via some set of mutational events. It's not purely a, a you know, some type of, transcriptional response to something in your body. Now, that's not all, that's not a universally held belief. I think there are people who've argued that you can actually have cancers that don't arise directly by mutation. It's a hard question because once cancers arise, they, uh, one of the things they do as part of their uh, strategy is to uh, typically uh, remove some of the breaks on how easy is it to get mutations. Again, you know, normal cells have all these regulatory mechanisms. One of the regulatory mechanisms they have is they test and test and test again all their DNA when the DNA gets replicated to make sure that mutations don't accumulate. Well, those machinery that does that tends to break down in cancer. So if you didn't have uh, lots of mutations when you started, you have lots of mutations by the time it's detected anyway. So that's not a a very easy question to answer, but my personal belief is probably the initiation is more about mutational events, whereas the progression to metastatic disease, to drug-resistant disease, to immune-evasive disease is very much more about uh, uh, adaptation to stress uh, within the context of epigenetics and and transcriptomics. But that's, that's a personal belief more than a proof, I would say. You know, we talked a lot about the EMT transition. Is there a reverse there is, transition? Yeah. And where does it happen and why? So there's a reverse transition. It's just called MET, not a very original name. And, uh, well, it happens again. Uh, you know, this, this whole idea came from developmental systems where you see transitions in both directions. These cells that uh, migrate to other parts of the body, when they arrive in those other parts of the body, they settle back down into more epithelial-like states. The general, so in, in, in the context of metastasis, uh, what again seems to be the case uh, in, in most situations is you, the cells that arrive there that can start growing are the ones that are in this sort of more plastic state. But eventually when, when the tumor starts getting bigger, uh, you know, then epithelial cells are more designed to grow quickly. So it helps, it helps the, so you start out with sort of small growths of these, uh, let's say uh, what we call hybrid uh, cell types. Uh, But then as time goes on, they differentiate into cells that are more efficient at growing. So you actually go back towards cells that you go back from these hybrid cells towards cells that are more epithelial as a metastatic lesion gets bigger and starts to become a more, you know, centimeter scale, you know, tumor within whatever secondary organ body had. So it does seem to occur in that context, whether it's necessary or not, I think seems to be situation dependent. Sometimes you never, you don't have to go back and you can continue to grow, excuse me, continue to grow in one of these uh, hybrid cell types. In other cases, it sort of seems to be necessary to go back. So we even we even wrote a paper at some point trying to discuss the various evidences in, in, in various tumors, which I think we called is MET necessary for metastasis or something on that order. So we tried to work with people who'd work on breast cancer, work on prostate cancer to try to understand, you know, is it actually necessary to go backwards towards an epithelial state when you're trying to really grow quickly again? And I think the answer is it depends on, on tumor type and, and situation. So it does occur and it could be very important in certain contexts. But it isn't what initiates metastasis, at least in our in our work. Is there a coordination amongst the cells of a tumor or across tumors to metastases? You know, uh, mediated by like cell to cell communication through yes. exercise of vesicles or other means. 
Uh, extracellular vesicles is something people have been trying to figure out. I don't think they know. People, the cells, but if you just ask about just general communication, the answer is clearly yes. Cells communicate. Very often, metastasis doesn't occur in, in a sort of a, uh, especially with these, you know, intermediate cells. Metastasis very often occurs with cells leaving the primary tumor in clusters where they sort of support each other. Clusters are more efficient in, in many ways because cells can support each other. And the so cells are interacting via a combination of direct mechanical interactions. They're physically sticking to each other and affecting each other. And, uh, and also by typically, you know, standard signaling pathways, release of, uh, you know, various signaling elements uh, uh, that they use to sort of inform each other as to what they're doing in a, in a, in a sort of metaphorical sense. Extracellular vesicles is one of those ideas that's sort of waiting around for a, for a definitive proof of how that is really relevant. I think people have been very excited by that because um, if you can understand what their role is, you have a chance of detecting tumors early because those things can wind up in the blood system. And so uh, you can maybe search the blood for that much before you have a simple way of, of non-invasively determining a tumor. I don't think there are any commercial successes along those lines yet, although lots of companies are trying to do that. But the answer is in this, in this framework, cells very often do cooperate with each other. And there are various reasons why that helps them actually navigate uh, through this sort of uh, metastatic you know, path of getting from the primary tumor through the blood, out of the blood, into a new organ. Uh, so they do cooperate uh, with each other. Uh, so it isn't, so cancer cells don't lose, you know, they, they, they lose the, the sort of breaks on a lot of their behavior but they don't complete, at least the, the ones that we think are, are most relevant, don't completely give up on the idea that it still pays to cooperate with your neighbors and to figure out what your neighbors are doing via signaling uh, systems in order to be more efficient at, 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 at getting what you want, which unfortunately getting what they want is not getting what we would want them to do. Uh, so the answer is yes, there's definitely in play various uh, mechanisms a lot of work has been done on just mechanical interactions of these cells as they move in clusters through the system, but there's also more, chem more traditional chemical signaling things that seem relevant. So yes, they, they, they're not individual cells just off on their own. They really still maintain some ability to form rudimentary tissue like uh, organizational structure. Okay, got it. Well, last question, Herb, where is the best place for people to find out more about your research and what, what do you expect that you're close to understanding in the next year or so? Anything? So, so more about my research, I guess, you know, there's a, I'm, I'm, I'm actually co-director or, or whatever you want to call it of a center uh, funded by the National Science Foundation called the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics. Uh, it's now a partnership between uh, Rice University, Northeastern University, several other places. Uh, there's a large website that contains, you know, my work, the work of my colleagues, not all of which is related to cancer. I would say a lot of it is related to other issues in biology, but, uh, but that would be a good place to look for just general background uh, in the, the website is ctbp.rice.edu. So that would be a good place to look. The problem which I think we're most interested in at the moment, so, so the cancer community, of course, has gotten very gung-ho about applying immune system ideas to cancer uh, because the immune system offers the possibility of uh, being able to out to you know that they can out outsmart the cancer cells. In other words, it, it isn't like you're just giving a drug to the cancer cell and the cancer cell is very adaptive and very uh, malleable and it can find uh, some pathway which is not very unique and but but some pathway to defeat the drug. And that's been the history of a lot of the drugs and even the targeted therapy that's you know 20 years ago where you know the the thing that was going to defeat cancer. Okay, it, it obviously prolongs life. It does. It, it's great to have. Have it, but it doesn't really defeat cancer. The cancers come back and defeat the drugs. The immune systems are smarter than just giving, you know, non-living drugs to a cancer cell. The immune system also adapts. So the idea has been to convince the immune system to recognize the tumor as being foreign, just like it recognizes uh, viruses, hopefully most of the time, uh, with some help sometimes, to recognize those are foreign and induce the uh, immune system to kill the tumor. So, so we've been trying to understand uh, why that works sometimes and why that doesn't work other times. So it's remarkable in the sense that now for some subset of tumors, 
this immune therapy really seems to offer the possibility of cure, which means no cancer, it doesn't come back, it doesn't somehow, you know, three years later just reappear. It seems to be, you know, a long-term cure that you train the immune system to kill whatever cancer type you had. And then it's every time a cancer cell emerges and tries to start growing again, the immune system is there ready to kill it, much like a virus being, uh, you know, you're forever immune to that particular disease. Uh, here, you'd be forever immune to whatever caused your cells to become cancerous. Even if there are cells left in your body, the immune system can then keep vigilant watch over those. So we've been trying to understand, and I think we're making progress on this, how changes in the cell's behavior affect its interaction with the immune system. So, and the reason for that is that I said that, that those miraculous cures uh, work in, you know, let's say in, in, in melanoma, which was the first case that really this was shown, work in, you know, 10%, 20% of the patients. And in the other 70 or 80%, it doesn't work. And no one has any idea why. So we think that there's a lot of opportunity to try to understand how this heterogeneity and these transitions among different tumor types will directly affect the way they interact with the immune system. And perhaps we can, you know, find ways of giving the immune system various, uh, you know, boosts to help them defeat a more wide range of possible behaviors of the tumor cells. That's the area we're very excited about. And hopefully over the next couple of years, we'll make progress on that. And again, it involves collaboration with uh, cancer biologists and, you know, other people and, you know, people who design drugs and all that. I mean, we, we can't, you know, we, we, we can't do everything. We can't do anything ourselves. Not that we can't do everything ourselves. We can't do anything ourselves. Uh, we need to directly, directly collaborate with all those communities. And it's fun to do that, actually. So um, we're very optimistic we can make progress. Well, very good, Herb. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Okay. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.